Book 2 Chapter 11 Totally Wrong There is no trap so deadly as the trap you set for yourself. Raymond Chandler, The Long Goodbye On December 11, 1970, Walter Cronkite began a report on the Green Beret murders with the line, Jeffrey MacDonald is a man under a cloud. It cuts to an interview with MacDonald and Congressman Allard Lowenstein, who had agreed to help with the case. They are seated on a couch in Lowenstein's Washington office under a map of Southeast Asia. Another blistering attack on the CID. Less than three months had passed since the conclusion of the Article 32 hearing and Colonel Rock's report that the charges against MacDonald were not true, but the case remained unresolved. MacDonald remained a possible suspect, if only because no one else had been arrested or accused. Days later, MacDonald appeared on the Dick Cavett show. Lowenstein organized the Cavett appearance as part of a campaign to have the investigation into the murders reopened. The show did draw attention to the case, but not as MacDonald had imagined. Some 37 years later, Cavett was interviewed by Bill Lagatuda for the CBS News show 48 Hours in an episode on the Jeffrey MacDonald case called Time for Truth. It was a reminder of just how consequential MacDonald's interview had been. Dick Cavett He knew how to do it, as they say in the talk show trade. He knew how to handle himself. Bill Lagatuda Dick Cavett remembers well the night he was face to face with MacDonald. His affect is wrong, totally wrong. My affect was, gee, to find your wife and kids murdered. And even his answer to that was something like, hey, yeah, isn't that something? Almost sounded like Bob Hope. Very like Bob Hope. A Battle of Affects Mine was okay. His was wrong, totally wrong. Was the problem a problem of affects? When he appeared on the show, MacDonald was focused not on the murders of his family, the four hippie killers, but on the wrongs committed against him by the military investigators. My next guest is the central figure in this matter, Dr. Now Jeffrey MacDonald. Applause. I call you Dr. MacDonald now, right? Jeffrey MacDonald. That's right. It's ex-captain and doctor. Yeah, I hope this isn't too painful for you. I feel like the journalist who asks the gory question. Could you talk about what happened on that night in February? Well, I could skim through it briefly. To get deep into it does produce a lot of emotion on my part. But very briefly, my wife went to an evening course at North Carolina on post at Fort Bragg. And I took care of the children and put away the dishes. My wife came home, and we had a before-bedtime drink, really. We watched a late-night talk show. MacDonald smiles sheepishly as the audience laughs. Cavett asks him about the hippies. I guess we all read, most of us either read about it or heard about it on the radio or something. And the story came out the one way, the first way, that the murder was committed by some people who were described as hippie in appearance and then later suddenly that you had been charged. What evidence suddenly appeared that made you charged? Well, at the risk of saying unbelievable things, but they're true, there was no evidence, which is the really fascinating thing about the whole case. What they did was apparently made some really gross, incompetent errors of judgment as they arrived at the house that night, approximately 4.30 to 5 a.m., and proceeded for the next six weeks along the wrong lines, looking at me, basically, all the while saying they were investigating this group of four people. And six weeks after the crime was committed, they called me over for a conference. They'd never really even questioned me, if you can believe that. Six weeks now has gone by. Right, they called me in and questioned me. It was really an interrogation. They'd turn the light up in front of your face, you know, and have all these little tricks... And they told me to go back to work, so I left the room and went back to work. And the next thing I knew, it was on the radio that I was considered the prime suspect. And my commanding officer called me and told me he was putting me in confinement. 
so I had five armed guards outside my room with loaded forty fives, And I couldn't make a phone call for three days. And friends of the family from Newville, Pennsylvania, Bob and Marion Stern, retained a civilian lawyer for me. And he got a hold of me finally after much trial and tribulation. Eventually, I was charged on May 1st, and we underwent this charade of a hearing. Yeah, I'd love to get into some of the details of that, because they're most interesting. But had you been guilty, then you presumably would have inflicted sixteen wounds on yourself. Twenty-three. Twenty-three wounds on yourself. What was the theory about that? Well, apparently, they didn't think enough. I'm not being snide in any manner. I mean, apparently, they really didn't think about any of these little things, like a motive for the crime, or how I could inflict twenty-three wounds on myself, some of which were potentially fatal. What's the motive for this? I still want to get some more of those details. Did it seem like a nightmare at that time? It's always easy to say he went through a nightmarish experience. Did you know that it was real and that it was happening, or did it actually seem like a dream? Yes, it still at times seems like a dream. Nightmare is a very mild term, really, for that night. What happened since has gotten so unbelievable, I mean, just getting worse and worse and worse, that you run out of words. Unbelievable kind of says it, but then you keep saying it, and it doesn't mean anything after a while. Yeah. There were no facts against me, as Colonel Rock's very beautiful report illustrates. He spent three months in the hearing, and then he spent five weeks writing his report, and the report says, and I think I'm saying it verbatim, that he recommends in the interest of military justice and discipline that all charges be dropped because they aren't true. Tell who Colonel Rock is, as opposed to the Army investigators. Colonel Warren Rock was appointed as an investigating officer to look into the evidence to see if I should be court-martialed for the murders. And he actually acted as judge and jury for this three-month hearing. And fortunately... I was fortunate in getting a very intelligent, strong man who could withstand some of the pressures that the Army was bringing to bear. There were people in the Army who wanted a court-martial, regardless of any evidence. Could that be just because they had to find somebody? Yes, that was a large part of it, I think. Absolutely. I think that's where I came up at six weeks. They had done really nothing, performed very incompetently, and they realized that... They had to do something, and they, uh, charged me. Well, let's talk about some of those things they did or failed to do when we come back. We have a message, and we'll be right, right back. Commercial break. I have watched the Cavett interview alone and with others. Some disposed to believe that MacDonald is guilty, others that he's innocent. There is no argument. There is something weird about his affect. But appearing on a network talk show can be a deer-in-the-headlights kind of thing. Just how is one supposed to act? Break down in tears? Demand vengeance? After the break, MacDonald talked briefly about Stokely, and about the girl who had been seen by Ken Micah near the crime scene that night. But mostly, he talked about the botched investigation, the incompetence of the Army investigators, and their claims that the crime scene had been staged. And clearly, the question that was still on everybody's mind, did he do it? Do people look at you and say, how do we know he didn't do it? Most people in face-to-face -face meetings have been nice, I must say that. But I don't think I'm being paranoid when I say that there is certainly a flavor of suspicion in a lot of people's minds. And it comes out in various ways. Some people pat you on the back as if to say, well, we know you did it, but it's okay anyway. And other people say, well, it's going to be very hard to have patients come visit you in the future, isn't it? Freddy Kassab was watching the show at home. He did not like what he saw. Years later, Kassab testified to his feelings about that night. He was still angry. He recalled that the minute the show went off the air, his phone started ringing. People couldn't understand how this man could go on television and almost say nothing about his family and what was done to them, just complained about what the army did to him and how much money it had cost him. Later that month, 
the Army finally acceded to Kassab's requests for a transcript of the Article 32 hearing. It was over 2,000 pages, but Kassab said he read the entire thing at least 20 times and McDonald's testimony over a hundred times. Chapter 12 Terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Kassab and others would point to the Cabot appearance as a turning point in the case, but it was one among many. MacDonald found several ways to make more trouble for himself. A month before the Cabot appearance on November 17, 1970, MacDonald placed a call to Freddy Kassab, his father-in-law. Years later, Kassab wrote about it. According to him, MacDonald said he had something very important to tell Kassab. When MacDonald expressed concern that the phone was bugged, Kassab suggested that MacDonald phone his office the next day. Kassab, who taped the conversation, says that MacDonald told him that he had gone on the town in Fayetteville looking for the murderers and found one. That after questioning him, beating him, the fellow admitted that he had participated in the murders, so Jeff killed him. I asked Mike Malley about this. I left right at the end of the Article 32 to go to Vietnam, and I would get letters from Jeff, and I would read the Stars and Stripes, and actually I remember reading the Stars and Stripes, and there was a picture, I think on the front page, of Jeff, and I think it was on the Dick Cabot show, and I read the article, or maybe it was in Time magazine, and he said he was in favor of the death penalty because these people killed his family. And I read that and I thought, you know, that's really kind of stupid. Well, shortly thereafter, I got a letter from Jeff, I think, I'm not sure, saying that Freddie had wanted Jeff to go down to North Carolina and hunt for the killers. And Jeff said he told Freddie that that didn't need to be done. And that's all I knew. After that, I didn't get much more information until I got out. Did you see McDonald after you got back? When I got out of the Army, I spent some time in San Antonio with my parents, and then I drove back east to see some friends, and I stopped in New York, where Jeff was working at the World Trade Center. They were still building the thing, and he was one of the doctors there on the construction site. And I stayed at his apartment somewhere, in Manhattan someplace. I remember I asked him what his plans were, and he said he was thinking about doing a residency at Columbia in Orthopedics. But these friends of his from Fort Bragg, these doctors, had said, well, why don't you come out to California and work in emergency medicine? Which he wanted to do, kind of, and I think he mentioned he had offers for books and things. But when you stayed with McDonald, you must have talked about developments in the case. He said that Freddie had become difficult or something like that, and I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, Freddie was pushing him to do stuff and go to North Carolina and hunt for the killers, and Jeff didn't want to do that. He wanted to put it all behind him and move on. And I kind of remember saying, maybe you ought to just kind of distance yourself from Freddy. And Jeff said, I can't do that. Freddy is now kind of a one-man investigator of the whole thing. I didn't know it at the time, but I've subsequently learned that Freddy was the loudest complainer of all at the Article 32 when they closed the hearings, because Freddy wanted to be in there every day listening. And he couldn't, because they closed the hearings to the public. Anyway, Freddy wanted the transcript of the Article 32. At some point, somebody gave Freddy a transcript, and Jeff mentioned that, that he'd been reading the transcript of the Article 32, and he'd been quizzing Jeff about stuff. And that's when I said, you know, I really think you kind of ought to distance yourself. Later that year, I drove out west, and by that time, Jeff had moved out west, so I saw him there. He said Freddy was becoming a nuisance, and I said, why is that? And he said, well, Freddy wants to keep going down to North Carolina and looking for the killers. Jeff told me at the time, I mean, I was just horrified. He said, well, I told Freddy, you don't have to do that. Me and my special forces buddies have taken care of them. And I said to Jeff, I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, that's all I told him. And I said, big mistake, real big mistake because I don't know what you mean by that either. I mean, it's one of these special forces fantasies that you folks seem to have when you're at Fort Bragg wearing your green beret. But it's not the right thing to do. Well, 
Apparently, right around that time is when Freddy really, really, really started reading the Article 32. I mean, he nitpicked it, from what I can gather. And he found out that Jeff had lied to him about killing the people who were involved in this. And my guess is, right around that time, which would have been in the summer or fall of 1971, is when Freddy really started turning. Why do you think McDonald would lie to Freddy like that? What he told me is that he wanted to move on, and Freddy wouldn't let him. And the only way he could get Freddy off his back was to say, we've taken care of it. Don't worry about it. Don't do it anymore. I didn't know Freddy anywhere near as well as Jeff did, but what little I knew about Freddy was he's not the kind of guy to trifle with. He was a fanatic. He was a fanatic in Jeff's favor, and if he was going to turn, he was going to be a fanatic against Jeff. And I think that's around the time that happened, because at some point, Freddy started agitating with the Justice Department and everybody else to reopen the case. But I think it all started when Jeff lied to him and said he'd taken care of it. And as I said, I remember saying, terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Chapter 13. Colonel Rock. Two CID documents are dated January 5th, 1971. They could come from two separate universes. In one document, Jack Pruitt and Peter Kearns are in the process of absolving the three major investigators, Grebner, Shaw, and Ivory, of any wrongdoing. It is a 29-page document signed by Colonel Henry Tufts, the CID commander. Here's one page. It is a series of claims and refutations. They did nothing wrong. 17. CID agents recklessly conducted interviews into McDonald's background using character assassination techniques and never evaluated the results of such investigation. Unfounded. Refutation. A principal reason for the extensive inquiry into the backgrounds of Captain and Mrs. McDonald was to determine any possible motive anyone might have for murdering Colette and the children while leaving the strongest member of the household alive. The background investigation was necessary in order to determine the character, reputation, and way of life of the McDonald's. The purpose of this investigation was to discover favorable as well as adverse information. Evaluation of the information received from these background inquiries led the CID to the conclusion that Captain McDonald possessed a good reputation. No evidence has been found indicating CID agents used character assassination techniques were reckless in their interviews, or failed to evaluate results of their inquiries. 18. CID agents never developed a motive and assumed that this was not significant to the investigation. Unfounded. Comment. To date, no motive has been found for the murders of Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen McDonald. The absence of a clearly discernible motive supports one of the leading theories of how the crime occurred namely, that it was a crime of passion. However, CID agents have continued to search for a motive. 19. CID agents recklessly placed Captain McDonald in the position of having to explain facts for which the CID could find no explanation, and because McDonald was unable to provide such an explanation, he was assumed to be guilty. Unfounded. Refutation. Although Captain McDonald did not give adequate answers to questions concerning certain aspects of events in his story, this alone was not the basis for the suspicion that he murdered his family. The second document is an eight-page interview with Colonel Rock by CID investigator Peter Kearns. It is as if the first document didn't exist. Had the CID been cleared of mismanaging the case? Or was there still an ongoing investigation? It's easy to think that this is just an exercise in cosmetics, that Colonel Rock was being interviewed to no real end. In essence, Rock is being asked to comment on the same charges that the CID has just cleared itself of, and Rock, although reserved, finds fault with just about everything. Peter Kearns Did CID agents give possible perjured testimony? Warren Rock at one point in the proceedings, I was under the impression this was a possibility, 
Regarding certain testimony of Chief Warrant Officer Grebner concerning the delay in submission of CID laboratory reports as evidence before the Article 32 investigation, when pressed on the point, Mr. Grebner changed his testimony and admitted to error in prior testimony. Since the government and the accused were represented by legal counsel, the hearings were generally conducted in an adversarial manner. The CID agents, in most instances, did not volunteer information, but answered questions. It was sometimes difficult and a lengthy process to obtain the necessary facts. Were the CID agents grossly negligent? I was impressed by the magnitude of the job facing a relatively small number of agents, and am of the impression that perhaps as a result they were literally swamped with information. Perhaps biased would be a better descriptive word to use. Did CID agents take ordinary investigative steps to determine if and how the crime scene had been changed prior to their arrival? By the time the first of the CID agents arrived, there had been, in my estimation, an unusually large number of military police in the apartment. The first effort of the agent was to try to determine what had happened and to call for assistance in a most unusual crime scene. He apparently did attempt to get excess military police out of the way and to preserve the crime scene, but to some extent it may have been too late. It is unfortunate that a relatively inexperienced military police officer, so far as capital crimes are concerned, was the duty officer. Did CID agents fail to inventory the crime scene? Yes, it would seem to be a logical procedure to inventory items of value and then check with Captain McDonald to determine if the list was complete to cover a potential theory of theft. Did the CID make an erroneous conclusion that nothing was missing from the house and that no unidentified persons could have been in the house? Obviously something would have been missing from the house. From testimony it appears that perhaps one or more rings are missing. Unquestionably, some unidentified individuals could have been in the apartment that morning. I'm referring to the period prior to the arrival of the military police. Did CID agents assume positive identification of some of the weapons thought to have been used in the assault upon Captain McDonald and his family? I have no information relative to the CID agents' assumptions. Ownership and source of probable weapons were not established during the hearing, with the exception of the club, which was probably from the McDonald household. Lieutenant Malley alleges that the CID agents never developed a motive and assumed that this was not significant to the investigation. Can you comment on this? If a reasonably believable motive was ever developed by the CID, it was certainly never presented during the course of the Article 32 investigation. Did CID agents recklessly place McDonald in the position of having to explain facts for which the CID could find no explanation, and because McDonald was unable to provide such an explanation, he was assumed to be guilty? This basically seems to be true, however I would not use the word recklessly. Did the prosecutors in conjunction with the CID agents fail to produce laboratory reports concerning the wax samples found in the McDonald house? The first CID laboratory reports did not indicate a source of the wax drippings found in Kimberly's bedroom and on the coffee table in the living room. Subsequently, a CID agent testified that additional candles from the McDonald apartment were sent to the laboratory for analysis. Toward the end of the investigation, it was verbally reported by the government that this second group of candles could not be matched with the wax drippings. Did the prosecutors and CID withhold the identity of a female resident of Fayetteville who may have been involved in the crime? Further, did they not pursue the investigation of this obvious lead and withhold the information from the defense? I am under the impression that the CID did not know this female could have been connected with the crime until after the witness, Mr. Posey, testified for the defense. Upon my instructions to the prosecution, CID agent Ivory, through the Fayetteville Police Department, contacted her on two occasions. I do not think, however, that the questioning was too well done. Mr. Kassab alleges it was apparent from footprints in the master bedroom that Kimberly MacDonald was there when her mother was being attacked, yet she was found in her own bedroom. In regard to this, the following fantastic statement was made by a CID agent. When hippies kill someone, they let the body stay where it falls. They don't move it. Can you comment on this allegation? 
In reference to the first question, I would only say this is Mr. Kassab's assumption, not mine. Regarding the second question, this statement, as well as many other fantastic statements, was made during the course of the hearing, but I was seeking only evidence and not assumptions or hypotheses. I called Colonel Rock, who is now in his 90s, but he hasn't been willing to talk about this case for the last 40 years. Nothing much has changed. He didn't want to talk about it. And so I called Hammond Beale, the captain and lawyer who had been his advisor. It's hard to believe. MacDonald lost his wife, both kids, and then ends up losing his license and freedom forever. Pretty bad for something you didn't do. You believe that he is innocent? Oh, I know he's innocent. I sat through the Article 32 for part of a year and was Colonel Rock's legal advisor to rule on all the legal issues that came up. I saw every piece of evidence the government had. And hell, any time they're arguing that the motive behind killing everybody was because the youngest kid wet the bed? Give me a break. I went to Walter Reed when they shrunk him all up. The government was determined they wanted to get him all psychoanalyzed and all that stuff, and all that backfired on them. Even the government psychiatrist said there was no way in hell he could have done it, because he couldn't have kept it inside. He couldn't have hidden it. Well, I certainly would have liked to have talked to Colonel Rock, but Colonel Rock evidently won't talk. He is in his nineties now. It's got to be, because I'm seventy, and I know he was twenty years older than I was. He was a full colonel and I was just a captain. But what a delightful fellow, all business of course, but just a delightful guy. What was Colonel Rock's opinion of the CID investigation? He didn't think that much of it, I can tell you that. They just bumbled at something terrible. But you've got to remember, most of them were young kids that had never worked a murder case in their life, particularly the MPs. And they tracked through that house and tracked blood and picked stuff up. I remember just what a nightmare it was. But they were kids. They had never seen a murder scene with three dead bodies. I'm sure it was upsetting. What was your role as legal advisor? We were there to seek out the truth, and wherever the chips fell is where they fell. And I can tell you right now, when all the evidence was in, he was not guilty of a damn thing. That's why the three-star general cut him loose and let him out of the army. And then to, what, ten years later get prosecuted in a civilian court? Really bad. One of the strangest aspects of this whole story is this woman, Helena Stokely. She was a jewel. Did you ever meet her? No, nope, never met her. Knew her address, phone number, her description, a picture of her. The CID claimed she was messed up on drugs. Fort Bragg back at that time was an open base, or fort, or whatever you call it. Anybody could come on the fort any time they wanted to, and by the time the cops got through screwing up the scene, it was too late. They had waited too long, so that's how Helena and her buddies got out. But she was right there in Fayetteville, and if I remember correctly, the FBI wouldn't touch it because the CID and the MPs had screwed it up so bad they didn't want anything to do with it. And, of course, we didn't have any authority to prosecute Stokely, because the government had no jurisdiction over civilians. That's why we turned it over to the FBI and said, go get them. But they wouldn't do it. And instead, because of the father-in-law, Freddy Kassab, wasn't that his name? Yes. He was the biggest supporter MacDonald had throughout the whole Article 32 investigation, turned on him afterwards and was just determined to go and have him prosecuted. And, of course, he was successful. I think it was the biggest miscarriage of justice that has ever been perpetrated. As this case developed, did Colonel Rock get upset? He was upset because of the way the cops had bumbled it and the silliness of the government's prosecutors arguing that he killed them because of the bedwetting business. What a silly bunch of bullshit. Everything that the government would put forth was just such baloney. And the way it looked was that they had just gotten lazy. If they had only focused on trying to find the murderers instead of trying to find the most convenient person to charge, MacDonald was the only one that they had available to them. Whatever. But didn't MacDonald do himself a lot of damage by agreeing to an interview with those three detectives, Grebner, Shaw, and Ivory? I don't think so. I don't think that really had a whole lot to do with it because they didn't get anything out of him. I mean, he told the truth, as best I remember what he said to them. 
and I think the reason why he was willing to allow them to interview him was because he hadn't done anything. When you're young and dumb, you think that the cops really are trying to find the truth, and if you know you didn't do anything, then why not talk to them? That was kind of McDonald's thinking on it. Chapter 14 A Great Fear On January 15, 1971, the CID formally assumed responsibility for the reinvestigation of the McDonald murders, Peter Kearns and Jack Pruitt, the two CID agents in charge of investigating the CID since January 1st, now refocused their efforts on McDonald. Pruitt kept a diary which provides a snapshot of their investigative interests during the first months of 1971. His first notes concerned the Kalins, McDonald's next-door neighbors at the time of the killings. Donald Kalin, a chief warrant officer, had since been transferred to Heidelberg, Germany. From Pruitt's Diary. 1 February. Interview of Vicki Kalin at Auburn University by Agent Bennett. She admits to receiving driving lessons from McDonald, but no involvement. Interviewed CW3 Kalin in Germany, who indicates that the family dog did not bark during the night of the murders and could provide no further information. Vicki Kalin, the very attractive her mother's description, older daughter, had been a babysitter for the McDonald's, along with Pamela, her younger sister. McDonald had given Vicky driving lessons, and the CID remained interested in the possibility that there was something more to their relationship. She was asked a number of leading questions. Did you ever give your mother or any other member of your family reason to believe that there was something intimate between you and Jeff? Did Jeff ever make a pass at you during your association with him? Do you think something might have developed out of your relationship with Jeff if your vacation had been longer? In the investigator's report, Vicki Kalin is quoted, I like to think I was attractive to him, and I did like him, but I'm not naive enough to think that he would have had an affair with me in front of his family. The journal continues. 2 February interviewed Mrs. Kalin and daughter Pamela in Germany. Mrs. Kalin was uncooperative and would not provide hair samples or submit to fingerprinting. Neither could identify any of the knives. Mrs. Kalin did relate that during the middle of the night she heard the voice of Colette raised in anger. According to the investigator's report, the Kalins felt they had been abused by the CID during the initial investigation. Mrs. Kalin said that, in some instances, the treatment of her family had been harsh and unprofessional. She cited in particular the incident in which her daughter had been pushed, in Mrs. Kalin's mind, into identifying one paring knife as being part of the McDonald kitchen inventory. The investigator in Heidelberg tried it again. He presented photographs of the alleged murder weapons, the two knives, the ice pick, and the piece of wood, to Pamela and her mother. Pamela stated that she couldn't recognize any of them, and then asked her about the bent paring knife she allegedly identified as McDonald property on February 19, 1970. She stated to me that what she had said was that that particular knife could have been McDonald property. I asked her how familiar she was with the items in the McDonald kitchen, and she replied that she occasionally washed their dishes while babysitting at the McDonald home. The four weapons, whether they were in the house or brought in from outside, were of great interest to the CID. Where did they come from? Did they provide evidence of intruders? Or evidence that there were no intruders? The investigators didn't get the answer they wanted, and so they turned to another item of interest, unsourced hairs. Pamela Kalin had dyed her hair blonde. She recalls she occasionally used a white hairbrush belonging to the McDonald's to brush her hair while babysitting. This, too, would become a relevant detail. And she was asked about the night of February 16th. Just before she fell asleep around 11 p.m., she was conscious of the voice of Jeffrey McDonald in conversation with someone. She couldn't hear the words, but she was certain it was McDonald's voice. It was coming from the McDonald living room directly beneath her bedroom. She could not state any definite facts about the second voice other than she felt it was a man's voice. The Kalins had a dog, Sam, a beagle mix, a good watchdog, supposedly. But on that morning, they could not recall the dog barking until after the MPs began assembling. 
And then there was Mrs. Kalin's vision, her Lady Macbeth moment. It appears at the very end of the CID statement. One of her daughters, presumably Pamela, was babysitting for the McDonald's during Christmas vacation. She called home and asked to be relieved for a short period. Mrs. Kalin agreed and took a ladies' home journal with her to the McDonald house. She was engrossed in some article and wanted to finish it. Her daughter left and the house was quiet. She sat on the couch reading, when suddenly she was overcome with a great fear. She looked up and saw Captain McDonald standing before her, dressed in a white shirt with rolled-up cuffs and dark slacks. He was bleeding and holding some sort of knife in his hand. The vision disappeared, and a few minutes later her daughter came back. And then there were other neighbors, the Pendleshocks, who lived in a detached house adjacent to the McDonald's. Janice Pendleshock's bedroom was about fifty feet from the McDonald master bedroom. One more statement, one more dog. Her dog Sambo was in the bedroom with her. At an undetermined time during the night of 16-17 February, Sambo woke her up with his barking. After shushing the dog, she heard the sounds of children crying and a woman screaming. She emphasized that she had heard these sounds concurrently. Mrs. Pendleshock had met Colette MacDonald at an officer's wife's coffee just before the murders, and Colette told her that she felt so safe at Fort Bragg that she left her doors unlocked. Evidently, Mrs. Pendleshock felt somewhat differently. About a month before, her house had been broken into. Someone had scrawled obscenities on the bathroom mirror using Mrs. Pendleshock's lipstick. Nothing was stolen, but some of her underwear had been scattered about. Also on the mirror was the command, Look in the closet. The intruder, or intruders, had misspelled both look and closet. Unfortunately, the report does not indicate how the words were misspelled. Mrs. Pendleshock looked in the closet, but found nothing out of the ordinary. After the CID had finished its investigation of McDonald's neighbors, it turned to psychiatry. Pruitt's investigative journal continues. 5 February. Conducted background check on Dr. Brussels. 7 February. Consultation with Dr. Brussels in New York City by Agent Kearns and Agent Ivory. Dr. Brussels discounted McDonald's story of hippie intruders and suggests that we look for a strong motive as might be known by Pep Stevenson and other members of the family. Dr. Brussels suspects that the murders are a means to cover what initially started as a family fight. The experts, hired by the defense and prosecution, had failed to find any significant pathology. The CID investigators felt they could do better and started shopping for a psychiatrist more congenial to their point of view. Enter Dr. James Brussel. William Ivory and Peter Kearns traveled to New York City on February 7, 1971. They furnished Dr. Brussel with a briefing on the crime scene, statements of Jeffrey MacDonald, and other background and investigative data, and he provided a number of salient remarks that reiterated the conclusions that the CID investigators had already reached. Dr. Brussel cut into the greatest infirmity in the prosecution's case, the need for a motive. Ivory writes in his summary of the meeting, A clean-cut motive must be established. The bedwetting of Kristen may have been a contributing factor to an argument between the McDonald's, but it in itself could not be considered the prime factor. In regards to the hippie-type individuals described by MacDonald, Russell stated that taking into consideration the fact that Kimberly had been injured in the master bedroom and carried back to her bedroom where she died. In his opinion, this is not consistent with hippie types. According to Russell, they would not pick up the child's body and place it in the bed and tuck the bed covers around her. He further stated that the female assailant's statement about acid rings false. Persons under the influence of LSD would not partake in such continued deliberate strenuous activities such as attacking a family. He also stated that LSD is a group doing, and if one of the assailants took it, most likely all would have. Therefore, there would have been at least four to six fairly lethargic persons in the house. Russell stated that if the hippies committed the murders, which he states he personally does not believe, it would be the first case he has heard of where they would be carrying and using an ice pick and paring knives. Russell also stated that of the information he reviewed, there is nothing to verify that any intruders were in the house. 
It was his opinion that the children were killed simply because they were witnesses to the attack on Mrs. McDonald or each other. He was also of the opinion that since the house was not vandalized, and no food, drugs, narcotic paraphernalia, or alcoholic drinks consumed or stolen, young adults or hippies most probably did not commit the murders. Russell related the physical and negative evidence at the crime scene refutes Dr. McDonald's version of the attack. In Russell's opinion, McDonald is not telling the truth, but this fact alone does not mean he is the murderer. Russell requested that he be furnished the psychological test results on McDonald and also the results of the Rorschach test inkblot taken by McDonald. Russell wondered whether the murder weapons all came from the house. He said it would be the first case he has heard of where hippies would be carrying and using an ice pick and paring knives. Clearly, Russell had not read about the LaBianca murders, one of the Manson homicides of 1969. The LaBiancas were killed with forks and knives from their own kitchen. Where drug-crazed hippies were involved, kitchen utensils were, at least in this one instance, the weapons of choice. Russell also seemed convinced by the fact that nothing was stolen from the McDonald home, a claim made by the investigators. McDonald had long claimed that jewelry was stolen. But what does this really prove? Look no further than the La Biancas. Items of jewelry and cash clearly visible were left undisturbed, and in a detail strangely reminiscent of the reports from the Kalins and Pendleshocks, the neighbors did not hear barking from the three La Bianca dogs. Russell was lost in a world of hypotheticals. He had never examined MacDonald. He had seen nothing of the case but the CID's own reports, reports carefully selected to make a case for McDonald's guilt. There is nothing to verify that any intruders were in the house. Essentially, he became a psychiatric Xerox machine for the opinions of the investigators who retained him. Chapter 15 Convinced in Her Mind Richard Mahone was the member of the CID reinvestigation team assigned to investigate Helena Stokely, and so, from the end of 1970 through the first months of 1971, he tried to get Stokely to submit to a polygraph examination. He also tried to convince her to provide hair samples and fingerprints. She refused all requests. Mahone turned to Prince Everett Beasley, a narcotics detective with the Fayetteville Police Department, who had first used Stokely as an informant in 1969, the year leading up to the murders. Beasley and Stokely had grown close. By all accounts, they were an effective team, making a number of significant drug busts. He told Mahone that Stokely confided in him as a daughter confides in her father, and that he could convince Stokely to cooperate with the CID. Stokely had moved to Nashville and had written Beasley a letter on January 20th, 1971. I'm really sorry I didn't get to see you when I was home this time. I wanted to so badly because it looks like that may have been my last visit home. All I ever do in Fayetteville is get in trouble. Beasley, what does the CID want of me? I didn't murder anyone. Are they going to keep hassling me? Is there any way I can take a polygraph to find out whether I was at McDonald's house or not the night of the murders without the CID finding out the results? Are they still suspicious of me or can I come out of hiding now? Right now I'm living in constant paranoia and need to know if that's even necessary. Here, she wasn't refusing to take a polygraph. She wanted to take one. And there was a sentence in the letter with odd punctuation. I didn't murder anyone a question mark, followed by two exclamation marks. Was it a forceful denial, or was she asking Beasley's help in figuring out what happened? Mahone and Beasley traveled to Nashville and interviewed Stokely on March 1, 1971. Beasley took notes on the interview. Elena stated to me that she has been having dreams for the past few months that may indicate that she knows something about this case. I asked her then what type of dreams she had been having. She stated to me that she has dreamed of seeing people struggling and that she noticed violence being administered and that she dreamed of seeing a lot of blood. 
She again told me that she had no knowledge of this night after 12.30 a.m. and that she does not know for sure what happened. And then, an odd detail. After the night of the McDonald incident, I picked Helena Stokely up for questioning in reference to this. She was in a joyful mood and joked about her ice pick. I then told her that this was a very serious situation and to act that way. I have known Helena for some three years. I know her to be a drug user and a drug pusher. She has furnished me with information that has resulted in the arrest and conviction of several drug dealers in the Fayetteville area. When Helena moved to Nashville, she became an informant again, this time for Jim Gaddis, a Nashville police officer. On March 25, 1971, he ran into Stokely during a drug bust at a house that, according to Gaddis, had been identified as a hangout for hippies. Stokely asked if she could speak to him in private. It is a peculiar conversation to have with a police officer. It is both an admission that she is under suspicion for murder and an interview for a job. She asked me if I was familiar with the McDonald murder case in North Carolina. I told her that I didn't know much about it. She told me that she was a suspect in the case, and she asked me if I could find out if she was still wanted by the authorities investigating the case. I told her that I would check on it. Then she told me that she had been a police informant in North Carolina on narcotics cases, and she told me that she wanted to inform from the Nashville police. The job interview was evidently successful. Stokely became not just an informant. She set up a number of successful sting operations involving hidden microphones. This was the era of Watergate. People were eavesdropping on other people, even in the Oval Office of the White House. With her permission, we bugged her apartment. Through working with her, we identified about 30 drug users and or drug dealers. We've also developed some other good police information. Our surveillance continues at this time. During this period, I've established a real good relationship with Stokely. I feel that she trusts me. On several occasions, I've talked to her about the McDonald case. She has told me a lot of things about the case. She has also contradicted herself several times about the things she previously told me. On April 23, 1971, Helena again told me that she wasn't involved in the murders, but that she knew who the killers were. She wouldn't tell me who they were. When I asked her why she wouldn't tell me, she said, Those people are suffering enough as it is. Whenever Helena talks about the murders, she gets real depressed. As of right now, she has me convinced that she really knows something about the murders. In fact, on the 23rd of April, she said that she wasn't involved in the actual killings, but that she had been there and had witnessed the murders. But she wouldn't give me any details about it. Stokely was asked to take a polygraph examination. Three cops, Gaddis, Robert Brizantine, a CID polygrapher, and Richard Mahone were present. Here are Brizantine's notes from the pretest interview. During pretest interview on 23 and 24 April 1971, Miss Stokely made statements substantially as follows. A. That due to a mental block, she does not remember her activities or whereabouts between 0030 and 0400 hours, 17 February 1970. B. That during a period of three or four months subsequent to the homicides in the McDonald residence, she was convinced that she participated in the murder of Mrs. McDonald and her two children. C. That she presently is of the opinion that she personally did not actively participate in these homicides, but may have been physically present at the time of the murders. D. That prior to the homicides, she had heard that the hippie element was angry with Captain McDonald, as he would not treat them by prescribing methadone for their addiction to drugs. Miss Stokely later retracted this statement and said that she only thinks she heard of Captain McDonald before the murders. E. That she had never been to Captain McDonald's residence prior to the homicides. F. That prior to the homicides, she had visited Castle Drive, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for the purpose of delivering illicit drugs to an officer she knows only as Bob. G that approximately 2,400 hours, 16 February 1970, she and a man named Greg Mitchell consumed LSD and mescaline. 
H. That she was using all types of drugs, opiates, heroin, marijuana, depressants, stimulants, and hallucinogenics, prior to and immediately following the homicides. I. That during April 1970, she was admitted to the University of North Carolina Hospital for hepatitis and drug addiction. J. That as a result of excessive drug use during the time of the homicides, she was not always oriented as regards time, dates, and surrounding. K. That since the deaths of Mrs. McDonald and her children, she, Stokely, has suffered nightmares whenever she sleeps. L. That due to these frightening dreams, she is afraid to sleep, causing insomnia. M. That her original dreams portrayed the word pig in blood on the headboard of Mrs. McDonald's bed. Miss Stokely described her dream by printing the word pig horizontally on the left side of a drawn picture of a headboard. She asserted that in her dreams the word pig is always on the left side of the headboard. N. That during the past three or four months, her dream places her on the couch in Captain McDonald's living room and that Captain McDonald is pointing at her with one hand while holding an ice pick that is dripping blood with the other hand. O. Oh, that during February 1970, she possessed and occasionally wore a pair of white boots, a floppy-type white hat, and a blonde wig. P. That following the homicides, she discarded the boots, wig, and hat. Q. That about the same time as the homicides, she stole some floral wreaths from a florist in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and displayed them in the front of her residence. R. That one of the wreaths had the word mother written on its ribbon, while one or more of the other wreaths had the word sister written on them. S. That immediately following the homicides, she wore black clothing, and on the day of the funeral of Mrs. McDonald and her children, she, Miss Stokely, meditated and wore black clothing. T. That she desired to attend the McDonald funerals, but did not attend as none of her friends would accompany her. U. That she went into hiding to evade police arrest subsequent to the homicides and considered fleeing from Fayetteville, North Carolina. V. That she knew the identity of the persons who killed Mrs. McDonald and her children. W that if the Army would give her immunity from prosecution, she would furnish the identity of those offenders who committed the murder and explain the circumstances surrounding the homicides. On the morning of the 24th, the day after the pre-test interview, Stokely started to equivocate. Perhaps it was because she had not been given immunity from prosecution, and she thought better of continuing in the same vein. Anyway, her story became vague. She had been incorrect in her statements, and she only suspected some people of committing the homicides. But when Brizantine mentioned that it had been raining that night, Stokely corrected him. It had been drizzling rain during the night, but it did not begin to rain hard until after the homicide. And when asked how she knew this, Miss Stokely exclaimed, I have already said too much. At this point, the three cops tried to convince Stokely to take a polygraph test. At first, she refused, and then, after lunch, relented. Gaddis was in the room, Mahone was hidden behind a one-way mirror, and Brizantine hooked Stokely up to the machine. The notes are extensive. There is a preliminary report, something that was to be typed over for a more professional presentation, and the final report that was submitted to the CID. The draft contains edits to be made before it became official. Based on a polygraph examination conducted on 24 April 1971, it is concluded that Miss Stokely is convinced in her mind that she knows the identity of those persons who killed Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen McDonald. It is further concluded that Miss Stokely is convinced in her mind that she was physically present when the three members of the McDonald family were killed. Miss Stokely cooperated during the entire examination. All parts of the examination were completed. Note, Linda, read this carefully and check typing errors before you final type. Ask Mr. Presson to take a look at it. A good hard look. Thanks. Mr. B. Let's step back one moment. Over the course of two days, Stokely had told contradictory stories. 
Presumably, the lie detector test was then administered to determine what she really believed. And guess what? The lie detector test confirmed that Helena Stokely truly believed that she knew the identity of the killers, that she believed she had been in the house during the killings. Isn't that in Brizantine's report? The fact that Brizantine had to add the phrase in her mind is evidence that he felt the need to qualify the result. The phrase occurs twice. The second time, Brizantine added it to his notes as an afterthought, a correction, before they were sent off to be retyped. All polygraphs are about things in the mind. They measure whether you, the subject, believe you are telling the truth. As such, they are belief detectors, not truth detectors. How are we to know what knowledge she actually had of the crime scene, as opposed to the knowledge she convinced herself that she had? How do we know what anybody knows about anything? Chapter 16 The Impossible Coffee Table, Part 2 We expect regularities everywhere, and attempt to find them even where there are none. Events which do not yield to these attempts we are inclined to treat as a kind of background noise, and we stick to our expectations even when they are inadequate, and we ought to accept defeat. Karl Popper, Conjectures and Refutations the growth of scientific knowledge. The naive listener will assume that the coffee table issue had been laid to rest. Hadn't Colonel Rock shown with one swing of his boot that the coffee table could have landed on its side? Hadn't he provided the perfect counterexample? And yet Martin Lonke, a crime scene research analyst, was contracted by the CID to file a report discussing in detail the weight height, width, and center of gravity of the coffee table. The report was released on July 27, 1973, two years into the reinvestigation of McDonald's crime in the hopes of making a case. It reads like postmodern fiction, an excursion not so much into the absurd as past it and into the void. Section 3 repeats claims familiar from the Article 32 hearing with some scientific terminology. The measured value of delta E is 3.24 feet per pound, hence the total energy is more than three times that necessary to take the table past pseudo-stable position 2. Under these conditions, it is reasonable to imply that the coffee table could not wind up on its side. But Lonke goes on to clarify that if the rocking chair had been parallel to and up against the coffee table, as in one of the reenactments you have, the coffee table could be prevented from completely falling over. Or a person could have somehow prevented the coffee table from landing face down. Even if the fight took place between the couch and the table, someone could have blocked or otherwise prevented the table from completing its motion. Certainly, if the captain's defense is pursued properly, it will be claimed that he was unconscious and hence could not account for the final position of the items. Section 7 brings up a number of additional points. The rueful admission that, whereas the probability of finding the table in the position shown in the photographs is small, it is possible in some circumstances. There is no law of physics which will conclusively prove that the table should have turned completely over. And then, in Section 8, Locke raises the lack of evidence of any large-scale scuffle. But what does lack of evidence mean? Did the lack of evidence mean that there had been no intruders? Hadn't MacDonald already addressed this during the Article 32? Bernard Siegel Go ahead and describe the struggle that took place there. Jeffrey MacDonald I thought I was being punched. I could feel like a rain of blows on my chest, shoulders, neck, you know, forehead or whatnot. I was just getting punched by what seemed like a lot of what I thought was fists. While I was holding on to the club, I suddenly got a very sharp pain in my chest, my right chest. Do you know the source of that pain? No, I do not. My instantaneous impression was, was that I thought to myself that he really threw a hell of a punch because it, like, took the breath out of me. You were of the impression that it was a punch that had caused that pain at that time? Well, yeah, but... Let's not make it black and white. 
I was being punched and I felt the pain in my chest, and I just instantaneously thought that was a, that was a good blow. I didn't stop and think, gee, it could have been a stab or a gunshot or a punch or... And so when I felt this pain, I let go of the club and sort of, you know, just directed my attention more to the other two people. That... The two white males? Right. Now, basically, you'd have to get the picture. I'd already been hit in the head, and it wasn't any titanic struggle, much to my chagrin. I was just trying to push up, and I was being punched. This wasn't a matter of, you know, me picking up chairs and hitting people over the head in defense of myself at all. I'd been hit on the head, and I was struggling up, and more or less I had been holding on to this club trying to pull myself up, and when I felt the sharp pain in the right side of my chest, I just let go of this and struggled with the other two people. Could this be why there was little evidence of a struggle? That Jeffrey MacDonald didn't fight back? Or if he did fight back, he failed to fight back effectively? He failed to save his family. At the end of his report, Lonky rhetorically throws up his hands. Based on the pictures and my visit to the residence, it appears that it cannot be said that the table should have turned over completely due to the number of interactions that may have taken place between the table, people, and the furniture. Therefore, based on the original statement of this problem, it is probably not worthwhile to pursue this avenue in an attempt to negate Captain MacDonald's testimony. These renewed efforts to prove that MacDonald rigged the crime scene the graphs, the measured value of Delta E, what were they really about? Absence of enough evidence of a struggle, the Valentine's Day cards standing upright and seemingly undisturbed in the dining room, the coffee table, the flower pot, the Esquire magazine, in positions that suggested to the CID that MacDonald had placed them there in an effort to fool the detectives into thinking there were intruders in the home. I tracked down Martin Lonke. His job had been to work with the physical evidence, but when we spoke, he was more interested in the question of MacDonald's character. Errol Morris. What's so puzzling about the case is that, on one hand, you have all of this forensic evidence, and on the other hand, someone who doesn't seem to be the kind of person who could have committed the crime. Martin Lonke. Right. I think you may be looking at... What do they call those people? Sociopaths. They actually drink their own bathwater. They believe their own stories. I always thought that he was sociopathic in some sense. I live in Southern California, and even when the district attorney of North Carolina contacted me, I had just moved here, I had learned that at Memorial Hospital here down in Long Beach, these people loved him. He was a gifted surgeon. He was a gifted doc. They loved him. His patients loved him. The hospital loved him. You seem to be describing two different people. I once sat down with the lawyer and said, How do people do this? How does this happen? Because he clearly did it. I mean, I didn't have any doubt. How could he be this good guy and be the masked man earlier in his life? Nobody could believe he was that guy. He was living the good life out there. A different guy. And if it wasn't for Freddy Kassab, his father-in-law, he might have gotten away with it. And Brian Murtaugh a JAG lawyer who followed the case to the Justice Department, became one of the lead prosecutors at the 1979 trial and remained a central part of the case until 2011. God bless Brian Murtaugh, a man with a mission. A man with a mission? Yes, he believed in this case. Even when the lie detector tests turned out to be something Jeffrey McDonald passed, he just went beyond it and said, Can't happen. Can't be. The guy's guilty of sin. He passed a lie detector test? Yes, he did. I'm not a shrink. My degrees are not in psychology, but if he's a sociopath, he doesn't believe he did it. That's the most important thing, and therefore his actions and his statements are coming from his heart of hearts. He doesn't believe he did it, and that's why he can pass a lie detector test. The lie detector tests can only test whether you believe you're lying. And if you believe you're telling the truth, you can tell a lie and still pass. It's pretty clear that it cannot test for absolute truth, per se. Right, right. That's why I go back to that definition of the sociopath. If you don't believe you're that guy, a killer, 
you're going to pass anything the test throws at you. I've come to my own conclusion that he may not believe he committed these crimes and so was able to continue with his life. The question really still remains, how could he be that guy? How could that happen? Don't sociopathic characters repeat the bad behavior of their past? Take someone like O.J. Simpson. Oh, don't go there. Don't go there. I'm one of those few guys who believes O.J. actually didn't do the Nicole Simpson murder. Really? Sure, I'm convinced he didn't do it. The only thing he's guilty of is being as dumb as a rock. And you know what? He didn't have to do what he did in Vegas to show you that. He's got a life history of showing he is not the brightest tool in the shed, and that's why Christopher Darden and Marcia Clark, Simpson's prosecutors, blew the case. They had him on both ends of it. They had him smart enough to plan it and dumb enough to be emotional. And you can't be both. You can't be both personalities at the same time. Try that one out for size. But I can go through the evidence. The evidence actually shows that he didn't do it. But McDonald is a different story. Yes, McDonald's unique. I sat down with the trial attorney and I said, How do people do this? Same question you're asking. How could he be that guy? And I remember he just looked at me and said, I wish I could tell you it doesn't happen. But these guys just get to a crisis point once in their life, they do something horrible, and then they get into a place where they believe they didn't do it. You got kids wetting their beds. You got a wife you don't want to be married to. She's pregnant again. Other guys have better things. You live on Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I'm making all this stuff up. I don't know if this went through Captain McDonald's mind or not. You look around and you say, shit on this. You just have a breakdown. You do something, then you dismiss it from your mind. You believe you didn't do it, because it's such a bad thing. How can you live with yourself? Right? Right. And he never does it again because he isn't that kind of a guy. Martin Lonke told me repeatedly that he is not a psychiatric expert. Still, he had presented a new theory of the psychopath in an effort to explain Jeffrey MacDonald. Namely, that the psychopath sees himself as completely normal, is oblivious to his terrible misdeeds or crimes. You do something, then you dismiss it from your mind. You believe you didn't do it. The monster with amnesia. The monster who forgets he's a monster. Not only are we unable to explain McDonald's motivation, McDonald is in the same position. He doesn't remember what he has done. He simply denies that he has done anything.